corporate crime, why Volkswagen committed one of the greatest frauds in business history, and how Adolf Hitler became Ferdinand Porsche's venture capitalist. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Legends and Losers. And man, am I ever glad you're here because today on the show, we have the legendary New York Times reporter, Jack Ewing, and his new book, Faster, Higher, Farther, The Volkswagen Scandal, will blow your mind. And uh, if you work in the business world, it's a real eye opener as to how a company can actually uh, do something illegal, immoral, and uh, really freaking horrible. And even if you're not in the business world, this is a fantastic uh, human story that, uh, that'll blow your mind in the relationship between Volkswagen and uh, uh, the early days of Volkswagen and uh, what you might call the Hitler regime it is interesting, uh, eye-opening, and scary. Never mind what they did uh, more recently. And um, Jack Ewing has done an extraordinary job of telling this story. Before we get to Jack, I uh, want to shout out to Eric Hardy and Ramsey Smith. Uh, my buddy Eric uh, posted a photo or sent me a photo recently of uh, his dash in his forerunner, his Toyota forerunner, uh, listening to Legends and Losers. And that according to the forerunner, um, uh, Legends and Losers is alternative. <laughs> and then I just got a, uh, a note from Legends and Losers guest, Mike Damphouse. Uh, my good buddy, the co-founder of Category Design Advisors, and he took the same picture in his car, and uh, I'm trying to remember what Damp drives now, but uh, whatever he drives, uh, they classify Legends and Losers, or that car classifies us as alternative as well. And um, Ramsey Smith on Facebook, once seeing all of this, an old buddy of mine from, uh, from the Science Days, says, quote, alternative implies difference. And that's what makes it awesome. Never want to listen to a worn out formulaic podcast. Love the fact that I never know what I'm really going to get, end quote. And Ramsey, we don't know what you're going to get either. <laughs> and that's what makes Legends and Losers uh, a magical mystery tour. And uh, we sure hope you're getting addicted. All right. I'm on tour with our good friends at NetSuite Next Ready Business Tour, September 20th. Uh, Denver, September 26th, Toronto, September 27th, New York, New York, and November 9th in beautiful Miami. And uh, we continue to pray for Florida, Texas, uh, the Caribbean. And if you're in a position to make a difference, we would ask you to do that because uh, we have friends in all of those places. We've been to all of those places. And uh, it's heartbreaking to see the photos and uh, read the stories in our browsers and, and on our television uh, news screens. All right. Jack Ewing, he uh, writes about business, banking, uh, economics, and monetary policy from Frankfurt, Germany for the Gray Lady, the New York Times. Um, he also worked at Business Week and the International Herald Tribune, and he moved to Europe in 1993 as a German Marshall Fund Journalism Fellow in Brussels. And once he got over there, he decided to stay, and hey, why wouldn't you? Um, over time, Jack has won the New York Times Publishers Award uh, in 2011 for his coverage of the European debt crisis. And as I mentioned off the top, Jack has written one of the most important business books and really stories of the human condition and how a company can really, really do bad and evil shit. And that book is called Faster, Higher, Farther, The Volkswagen Scandal. And this dialogue is riveting. Jack is captivating, insightful. And uh, man, are we ever glad to have him. And so here he is, Jack Ewing on Legends and Losers. So Jack, um, is it true that Adolf Hitler loved the VW bug? Yeah, well, he was actually, uh, I mean, looking at it from a Silicon Valley point of view, he was actually the sort of the angel investor for the, uh, the VW bug. He's the guy who commissioned it, who hired uh, Ferdinand Porsche to design it. Uh, and uh, so he not only loved it, he created it. So you would call him the angel capitalist, the, the angel who, who uh, funded Volkswagen? Maybe, maybe the devil in this case, but he was the, yeah. uh, you know, the, venture, the venture capitalist who, uh, well, he stole the money, but he was the one who got the money that uh, built, uh, you know, that paid to, to develop the Beetle 
and then to build this uh, factory to, to construct it. The devil capitalist. And you said he stole the money. What, what do you mean by that? Well, they, to, to get the financing, they confiscated uh, the treasury of the union that had represented uh, the uh, German workers. Uh, so German auto workers, they just took over the union and took all their money. And then they used that to invest and build this uh, enormous factory. And what I was just there last week, and one of the most, one of the things that struck me uh, is that when they, they started out, before they had built a, a single car, they built the biggest factory in the world. And that's, that's kind of a, just to shows you kind of how crazy the whole thing was back then. I mean, nowadays you start in your garage and as your sales go up, you get bigger and bigger. And, and the Nazis were so grandiose, Hitler was so grandiose that they had a design for a car, they decided they wanted to build it. And then from scratch, they built this enormous factory in Wolfsburg that was at the time the, the biggest factory in the world and still one of the biggest factories in the world. And am I remembering this wrong? Um, it's been a bit since I uh, read your book, but was, was there a VW factory that uh, either was a concentration camp or was the site of a concentration camp? Or am I, am I remembering that wrong? No, that's, that's absolutely right. So they, they built this factory in Wolfsburg before the war broke out. And uh, so the war breaks out and by then they had only built a couple hundred Volkswagen Beetles. Uh, so the factory switched to war production and because it was so new and Wolfsburg was in at the time an isolated part of Germany, they didn't, they didn't really have any workers. Uh, so they started importing them in different ways. I mean, some the first ones came voluntarily from places like Italy and then as the German army marched east, they started conscripting people and then by the end of the war, they were actually taking people from concentration camps, including Auschwitz and using them in the factory as a slave labor. So the, the VW factory was a slave labor. It wasn't actually a quote unquote concentration camp. Is that, well, how, should, how should I think about it? Well, it was kind of a de facto concentration camp because uh, you know, they had guards and if you tried to leave, you'd get shot and they kept people in terrible conditions in uh, unheated barracks. Uh, uh, you know, technically it wasn't a concentration camp, but the conditions were basically the same for, for those inmates. So they didn't have a family movie night on Thursdays like they do at Facebook's campus? No. <laughs> no, no, it was really a terrible condition. It was maybe marginally better for the inmates than being in a concentration camp. I mean, they would get slightly better food, uh, but, you know, it was pretty bad. When there was an air, air raid, they wouldn't get to use the air raid shelters, and it was, it was really bad. And these quote unquote inmates were regular folks who, who were now being subjected to this. Obviously I couldn't go home to my wife. <laughs> no, 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 they were prisoners. You know, it's, it's interesting. There's that old, I think it's a Chinese proverb. If I remember that says the fish rots from the head down. And I know I'm jumping forward, but you know, I have the, I have, I, I'm a ADD kid. So we're going to, we're going to chase rabbits down zebra holes. But when a company starts, with this kind of evil, what impact do you think it has over time uh, on their culture? You know, that's a good question because um, the, uh, you know, after the war, the people who had run it during the war were uh, basically kicked out. In fact, it was the British who, who got the, comp the, the company going again as a car manufacturer and then it passed back into German management. And it always had a very authoritarian culture but it wasn't like the Nazis were still there, uh, you know, running it the way they had. Uh, and then in later years, in the 50s and 60s, you had actually had chief executives who were trying to uh, make the place less authoritarian and less hierarchical. But then what happened in the early 90s was that uh, the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, Ferdinand Piech was his name, who had been working his up, way up through Audi, he then became the chief, chief executive of Volkswagen. So then you had the company kind of coming full, full circle from Ferdinand Porsche, the designer of the Beetle, to his grandson then running the company. And uh, the grandson was a very, I think would be unfair to call him a Nazi, uh, he wasn't, uh, but uh, he was a very authoritarian figure, there's no question about that. And uh, you've compared them, and if I get any of this wrong, you have to confuse me, you know, I, or you have to excuse me, I, uh, you know, 
consume probably too much scotch and, and other things. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've compared the grandson to, um, you know, the icon of Silicon Valley or modern Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs, have you not? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in a, you know, sort of a, a German way, automotive way, but what they had in common was that, you know, he was extremely passionate about the product. And there's no question for all his personal flaws, he was a, a genius of automotive, automotive design and, and engineering. And when he took over in the early 90s, Volkswagen was really in a serious crisis, in danger of going bankrupt, and he turned it around. And you have to give him credit for that. And he was, what makes him similar to Steve Jobs is he was really involved in the details of the products. Uh, and, and, and if I'm not mistaken, he was a, a, one of the principal drivers in the recreation of the Beetle, was he not? Yeah, well, the, um, I think Volkswagen's biggest problem was that, you know, the Beetle had run out of steam and they were trying to, like, uh, find their footing. The Beetle was a very unique product, but then they had to sort of compete in the same categories as everybody else. Water-cooled sedans, competing with Toyota, Honda, and so on. And um, so one of the things they did is they did revive the Beetle as kind of a nostalgia product. But that was, in terms of sales, that was relatively small. The bigger thing he did was he just brought... Uh, a new level of kind of engineering excellence to the whole Volkswagen lineup. And uh, he sort of redefined Volkswagen to mean German engineering for every man. So for people who couldn't avoid Ford BMWs and Daimlers, a BMW, a, a Volkswagen was pretty close. And ironically, wasn't that sort of the Hitler idea in the beginning, the strength through joy car? Wasn't that the idea, a cost-effective, reliable car that, you know, many people of, uh, of different economic uh, situations could afford it in Germany. Wasn't that what he was thinking? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, it really annoyed the Nazis that, you know, in, in the United States, everybody was driving around in, in Model Ts, thanks to Henry Ford. And the Germans actually invented the automobile. They invented the diesel engine. They invented the four-cycle engine. But uh, in the 30s, you had to be rich to own a car in, in Germany. And that really annoyed the Nazis. And so the whole idea of the Volkswagen was car that everybody can afford. Now, you've called this, uh, I don't, should we call it a scandal or a fraud? What should we call what happened at VW they're most both, recently? They're both uh, totally accurate. It's a scandal and it was a fraud. Volkswagen has admitted to fraud charges in the United States. So I think I like calling it a fraud better, Jack, because scandal, you know, some of us can get caught up in a scandal uh, not of our own choosing. You know, you could be standing on a street corner and something weird could go down and you could find yourself in a scandal. Or, you know, I was at a, a software company called Mercury and we got investigated by the Securities and Exchange Commission for um, uh, stock option backdating and inappropriate accounting for that. And that was a scandal. We got investigated. I had nothing to do with the fucking scandal and I was in the scandal, right? I had to deal with the scandal. Right. But, but these guys committed fraud, which then created scandal. Yeah, right. And so you've called this one of the greatest frauds in corporate history. Why, why do you say that? Well, just think of the, the scale of it. I mean, 11 million cars driving around in the world, about 600 of those in the United States that were equipped with uh, cheating software, with illegal software that was designed to dupe the regulators. So every single one of those cars was a violation of the law, and they were driving around for almost a decade. And then if you just look at the financial cost, uh, it was 20, more than $22 billion uh, in the United States alone for fines and settlements uh, and all the legal ramifications, and there's probably more to come in uh, Europe. So, Do you have a sense, Jack, what it's going to end up costing the VW group over time if we're at about $22 billion now? It could easily be double that. You could get above 50, mil, 50 billion. It's hard to say, you know, there's a shareholder suit that's probably going to cost 10 billion, something in that order. They're spending a fortune just on legal fees. I mean, there's thousands of lawyers working on this. Is this the full-time employment act for um, uh, German lawyers? <laughs> Absolutely. It's a great time to be a lawyer. Everything, you know, everybody's working. No question about it. Now, not only did they lie to the public and lie to regulators, um, and, and I, I do want us to get into some of the details there because they're fascinating, but um, tell me about this thing called nitrogen oxide that they're puking into our world. 
Yeah, well, the thing about diesel is that it's uh, more fuel efficient than gasoline. A diesel motor extracts more energy from a gallon of fuel than a gasoline motor. So it emits less carbon dioxide. And so to that extent is, you could argue, sort of climate friendly. Well, and, and that's why a diesel car, you go and fill it up and you can get, you know, with the same amount of uh, gas, um, you know, 500 gallons, whereas a gas car, maybe you get three. Is that? Yeah. Uh, it, it, miles, it, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. 500 miles yeah. to, the, to the tank is what I meant. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's, that's the big advantage of diesel, basically. Is but it burns way. hotter, right? Yeah. And is this nitrogen oxide one of the primary things that allows it to burn hotter and therefore get more, more uh, if you will, bang for the fuel buck? That's the other way around. It's the burning hot that creates nitrogen oxide as, a, as, a, as a, a byproduct. It's just the heat causes the nitrogen and oxygen in the air to fuse into nitrogen dioxides, which are, then have a lot of bad health effects. And can you explain to me, like I'm a drunken eight-year-old, why nitrogen oxide is such a bad thing in our, in our air? Well, it gets into your lungs and it sort of uh, interacts with the, the membranes in your lungs. And so it can cause asthma, particularly if you're an eight-year-old, hopefully not a drunk eight-year-old, but if you're an eight-year-old, it can cause you to get uh, asthma. If you already have asthma, it can provoke an attack. Uh, it causes cardiovascular problems. Uh, there's studies showing that when nitrogen oxide levels in the atmosphere are high, that uh, hospitals get spikes in emergency room visits. Uh, and then nitrogen oxide is also the main thing that causes smog. So if you live in Los Angeles on a day when there's a lot of smog, that's nitrogen oxide basically. And most of it's coming from diesels. And so when I'm flying into or any of the you know great big cities in the world you know i can remember the first time i ever flew into a place like sao paulo or seoul south korea or mexico city or beijing or you know pick your big 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 like mega city and and you look at it from the air and I, i'm sure you've had this experience jack and you just go like what what the fuck are we doing like the the layer of crap is so thick I expect the, sh the plane to shudder as it has to break through. Is that, is that nitrogen oxide? Yeah, it is. And, you know, gasoline cars also produce it, but in much lower quality, uh, quantities, and it's easier to control. It's, and diesel, it's much harder to control. So what's all this stuff we hear about, quote unquote, eco-diesel? What is that then? Or is that just marketing bullshit? No, it was marketing crap. Uh, you know, clean diesel was what was Volkswagen's tagline. And they spent a lot of money on advertising. They had Super Bowl commercials. And uh, we know now that that was basically a lie. And so what's the difference between, you know, a 2015 uh, nitrogen oxide puking uh, VW and a, a car I would buy from another manufacturer today that's a diesel? Well, I don't know. The more we learn, we're, the more we're finding out maybe there isn't a big difference that everybody was kind of doing this at some level. But Re Really? Yeah, well, I mean, the latest was Fiat Chrysler. They, they say they weren't doing anything wrong, but they are uh, having trouble with the EPA uh, because of their diesel pickups. Um, Is there any, any indication that they did anything, uh, you know, anywhere near as nefarious as VW? It was a smaller number of cars, around 100,000 cars, and it doesn't, it seems to be less nefarious in the sense that Volkswagen had software that could recognize when the car was being tested and then crank up the pollution control so the cars looked clean. And it doesn't appear that's what was going on at uh, Fiat Chrysler, at least not quite as blatantly. Uh, and that case is still pending. So, you know, we're not, I'm not quite sure how that's gonna turn out. So there's a chance this is more widespread. Yeah, yeah. But I think the thing is that, you know, there just aren't that, in the United States, there just aren't that many uh, diesel passenger cars. It's just a small part of the market. Yeah. And Volkswagen was the cup really tried to uh, push that technology, which had been very successful in Europe. They tried to sell it to Americans. So most of the diesels on the road were and probably still are, when you're talking about passenger cars, were Volkswagens. Yeah, so, interesting. And so um, let, let's be clear these guys intentionally wrote software so that when the USB or whatever it is gets plugged in by the EPA or whatever the monitoring body was, uh, you can unpack it for me, 
but the car knew when it was being monitored by regulators and there was a fucking piece of software that essentially lied to the regulators on purpose and that all got created purposefully and intentionally. Yes, exactly. And the way it worked, if, if, stop me if this gets too granular, but the way it worked was that, you know, when they, the way they test the cars, the, the EPA tests the cars or, or the California Air Resources Board is they put it on rollers inside a garage and they stick sensors up the tailpipe and and then they have a sort of simulated driving cycle and they have a trained driver who sits in the car and he drives a cycle that's kind of like a you know simulates hills and city and country and so on you can, but the car is essentially stationary in a garage but it's it's changing its speed it's it's right. it's the wheels are behaving as if it's on a twisty road right exactly and you can plot all this on the graph and what volkswagen did was it wrote into the software and the graph was public knowledge so it put into the software the software could recognize this cycle and then it would crank up the pollution controls and roughly how many years uh from the time of creation of this nefarious evil shit software to the time these bastards get caught roughly how long is that it was uh, it was almost a decade because it started in 2006 was when they were developing the engine and then realized they couldn't meet the U.S. standards and 2015 before uh, they got caught end of 2015. So I have a question about that. I hear a lot today and I'm sure you do too that because of social media uh, and the world that we live in today uh, bad things like this can't really happen at scale because individuals like you and I have a voice. So if I'm, you know, Graham Souden or Snowden or however you say his name on one extreme, or I'm a mid-level engineer at VW, when I find out something nefarious is going on and I think that my organization won't listen to me, I have an opportunity to go public with it. Whether you think Graham's a, a criminal or a hero, but in the case of a corporate situation like this, I th there's a lot of talk, particularly here in Silicon Valley, about you know, democratization, how technology democratizes everything and makes everything a meritocracy and increases transparency and all that because of the fact that, hey, if, if I work for a company that does something nefarious, I could write a Medium blog and expose them tomorrow. But yet this went on for 10 years. So, so help me with this dichotomy that I get fed this bullshit that social media helps, but yet this went on for 10 years. Yeah, we don't, as far as I know, there was nobody who went public with this. Nobody went to the regulators, nobody who put any documents on social media. And there was a lot of people who knew about it. And I think that- How many people inside VW do you think knew, had Jack? Be, it had to be in the hundreds. And- For they, decade? Yeah, basically. I mean, I think the number increased over time, but uh, it certainly, it was a lot of people. And they- uh, I think it says a lot about Volkswagen culture. You know, it's a very conformist place where people are expected to do, do their jobs and stay in line. And people were afraid to step out. And they didn't believe that top management would be sympathetic if they went to them and said, oh, there's a problem going on here. They didn't have any place. To, there were people who, I've talked to people who felt bad about it the whole time. Uh, and, and maybe even kind of tortured by it, but they didn't know where to turn. And I don't think anybody thought uh, that going to social media would help. And maybe the other what about that, going to the New York Times? Wouldn't the gray lady make a difference if I'm that person who said to you, I felt bad about this for 10 years? I, I, I don't, excuse me for not knowing who the New York Times in, in, in Germany is, but if there's no New York Times of Germany, there's a New York Times of New York Times, there's a Washington Post, there's a Wall Street Journal. I mean, I don't give a shit what anybody says about quote unquote fake news. But last time I checked, you guys were still um, extraordinarily uh, respected around the world for journalism. Um, and so why didn't anybody reach out to one of the legendary, you know, uh, icons of journalism? Yeah, that's a good question. But as far as I know, nobody did. You know, I think again, it was people didn't see I, the thing is that if you do something like that, there's, there's, there's no reward for you. I mean, maybe you, you feel better about yourself, but there's a good chance if people find out who you are, you're never going to work in the business again. You'll become a pariah. And if you work at Volkswagen in, in, in lower Saxony, Germany, 
there's no other place to work except for Volkswagen and the suppliers. Doesn't the town own part of the business? Am I misremembering that? Uh, it's not the town, it's the state owns okay. 20%, the state of Lower Saxony. So, and it's a very close. So be the equivalent of the state of New York or the state of Detroit, no, or the state of Detroit for the love of God, the state of Michigan owning part of Ford? Yeah, exactly. And, and not only that, but, and, and the UAW had half the seats on the supervisory board. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to them and their hookers and girlfriends. And <laughs> who doesn't like Brazilian girlfriends? <laughs> uh, but, you know, as I think about this, uh, the, the quote that rattles around in my head, Jack, is that famous legendary quote from Drucker where he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and what I love about your book, you know, I think your book is one of the most important business books written in the last decade. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I want to help you promote the book because I, I don't think enough people know about it. And I don't think enough people get why it's so important. And, and, and let me give me a sec to tell you why. I, I know when I hear this, I think, well, this could never happen in a company I'm involved with. This would never happen in Silicon Valley because of all the bullshit I just told you, transparency and social and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, that's just, that's just fucking wrong, isn't it? This could happen anywhere, couldn't it? Yeah, and it has happened in the United States. I mean, if you, if you look at Enron or more recently Wells Fargo, different kinds of companies. But I think it's the same basic principle, you know, very over the top goals, a lack of uh, ethical standards, draconian consequences for people who don't meet their goals. And it's a recipe for this kind of wrongdoing. Well, and you know, it's funny that you raise Wells Fargo because in my preparation for our dialogue today, I started looking at some of the American examples and we can talk about Silicon Valley also if you like, I think we should, but of course, Wells Fargo came up, and if I'm, if I'm not uh, misconstruing this, as Archie Bunker said, uh, nobody at Wells Fargo went to jail, right? And the CEO and the gal in charge of the business unit that did this nefarious bullshit around opening fake accounts to meet their bonuses exited the company with a 120-something million dollar uh, uh, goodbye package. Am, am, I, am I misremembering this stuff? I thought they had to give up some of their uh, their bonuses in the oh, end. Oh, that's terrible. But, but I mean, yeah. nobody went to jail. No, not yet that I'm aware of. And I, I, I haven't followed it that closely enough to tell you, but I'm not aware of any uh, uh, criminal cases linked to that whole case. So, and this is a bit of a diversion, but um, why do you think there's such a dichotomy between quote-unquote white-collar crime and quote, you know, real crime. You know, why is it if I get caught in certain states with, you know, a little bit of pot or I get into a fight or whatever, I can end up in jail for 10 years, whereas these assholes can, you know, do what they do in our country and nobody goes to jail. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's a really, really good question. And uh, I think the, the, the answer is that it's, it's always really hard to prove because the way corporations work, you know, everybody has their little piece of, uh, of the scandal or of the fraud that they uh, took part in. And it tends to be sort of a cumulative thing. One guy did one thing, another guy did another thing. So there's no, nobody there who's kind of holding the smoking gun or gets caught with the pot on them. Everybody can say, well, I was just, and this is what people are saying at Volkswagen right now, they're just saying, well, I was just a cog in the system. You know, I wasn't responsible. I was under pressure, blah, blah, blah. And it's very hard to, and then when you get to the very top level, uh, often there's no paper trail. This is all being discussed verbally, and it, uh, it's, it's very hard to prove. Um, I, I think it, the other element is that it's also maybe we need, uh, there's another book out uh, called the, uh, the Chicken Shit Club by Jesse Isinger, which addresses this issue of maybe there's just a lack of courage among the um, uh, prosecutors or a lack of resources or a lack of political support to really go after the people at the time. So, you know, the weird thing is a former uh, public company officer and director, I, I remember distinctly when Sarbanes-Oxley um, got passed and then when it came into effect. And I remember looking at it and God knows I'm no lawyer or accountant. I got thrown out of school for being stupid and grade 10 math was the hardest 12 years of my life. That said, I looked at Sox, Jack, and I sort of thought to myself, 
I'm not sure these new regs are that different than what was there before, but they're um, more muscular, so to speak. And, and the big increase in muscularity, if you will, uh, that I remember was CEOs and CFOs and the director who particularly oversaw the, the uh, audit committee on the board, these folks have to sign, quote unquote, personally, whatever that means. Now, I looked at that and went, well, you didn't think you were personally responsible for before? Like the guy who's, who's captaining the Titanic, it's his fucking fault, period, right? Full right. stop, fuck, period. And so Sox comes in and I guess maybe makes this more explicit for executives and, and directors of boards who didn't know they were fucking responsible, but okay, great. And so I guess my question with that is, why didn't something like Sarbanes-Oxley that I thought was supposed to at least deal with this on the financial side, you know, didn't stop a Wells Fargo or for that matter, a VW? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I... I'm not sure I can answer that question, Christopher. Obviously, there's a, a, a hole in the law. It should have. I guess it shows that we still need to do more to make sure that chief executives really are responsible. I mean, Volkswagen, which is you know what I know about best, that you still the chief executive resigned when the the whole scandal became public, but the board is still run by insiders. It's still run by people who were there when all this was taking place. The head of the supervisory board of Volkswagen was the chief financial officer when all this was taking place. There hasn't really been a wholesale. They're, they haven't brought in a whole lot of, of new blood. And, and, and I'm sure they don't invite you to the strategy planning meetings. But if you, if you think about the board and senior executives, you know, direct reports to the CEO of VW today, um, A, what percentage of them were there prior to this? And, and then I'll ask you the follow, what my follow-up question is. Were they all there or there, is there any new blood? Uh, at the very top level, it's pretty, I'm thinking there's a couple of people from outside, but not very many. The, the head of the Volkswagen brand, a guy named Dies, came just before the scandal became public. He came from BMW. You could say he's new blood. Uh, they have a new compliance person who came from outside. But if you look at them, I'm thinking about who's on the board and it's pretty much all people who were uh, lifers. The chief executive was a lifer. He spent his entire career at Volkswagen. But it's not like they went out and hired some, you know, unbelievably big, well-known legal, if you will, uh, personality uh, to come in and clean them up. That didn't happen. Well, they did hire a uh, former Supreme Court justice in Germany, a woman named Holman Denhardt, uh, who was supposed to do that. She was supposed to be the head of compliance, but she uh, didn't, she lasted about a year. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that one, and, and that one looked like, I don't know, you tell me you're way closer to it, but that one looked like it was just a Wizard of Oz-like optical trick they were trying to pull. I don't think she had the authority that she needed to do what she was supposed to do. So, what year do they decide, hey, we are going to purposely write this software and, and dump this horrible chemical into the world? What, when, when do they decide to do that? This was in 2006, and they were developing a new diesel motor uh, that was going to be their basic sort of standard diesel motor in all their vehicles, Volkswagens, smaller Audis. Uh, and then there's brands you don't see in the United States, Skoda, and say. Uh, and These were the TDI engines. That's what they called them, right? That's their brand. And this particular engine was called the EA-189. And they, part of the whole plan was this was, they were also trying to recapture their past glory in the United States. I mean, to this day, Volkswagen has never sold as many cars in the United States as it did during the heyday of the Beetle. And you know, the one thing, and this is a side note that I have, don't understand, and maybe it's because I live in California, uh, if you look at what the job BMW has done with the Mini Cooper and reviving that brand, you know, it's extraordinary. It was, the, it was the biggest new car launch in history until the Prius. And, uh, and they're awesome cars. I, 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 have you driven one of the new yeah, Minis? Sure. They're sure. fun, right? Yeah, lots Kinda, of fun. It, it makes you want one, right? Right. And so I have thought, and I know they brought the, the Beetle back, which I thought was a wonderful, fun thing to do. But with the VW bus, you know, the surf bus, the surf little mini wagon, whatever they called that thing, and the Carmen Ghia, 
Those were two of the funnest cars ever. And that back in those days, you had the Beetle as sort of the flagship car. But to me, you had the, the, the bus and the Carmen Ghia kind of right behind it as these also really fun, playful cars that had different, different utilitary uh, use cases, if you will, than the Beetle. And I looked at it and went, if I was VW, this is before the scandal, why wouldn't I revamp both of those cars? Because for me personally, if they did that and they did the quality job that uh, BMW did with the Mini, I'd sort of be forced to buy both of them. But yet they never were able to recapture that either with the bug. And of course, they didn't bring back the, 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 the bus or the Carmen Ghia. Um, why, why, why aren't they able to capture that glory from the 60s and the 70s when they were so beloved? I think part of it is that, I mean, the, the, it was kind of an accident how popular the Beetle became. You know, it was something that was hard to kind of bottle and reproduce to begin with. And, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to build that kind of car these days because, because of emissions rules and safety rules and everything. You know, cars are just a lot more complicated. Those cars were really dead simple, you know, and it was an air-cooled motor, no computers, uh, not much in the way of emissions control. You could... It, uh, take them apart yourself. I tried to rebuild a Beetle engine myself when I was a teenager. I didn't do very well, but it, you, you never do that. Are, are, were you like me, Jack, with any kind of an Ikea product where you wonder why there are so many extra parts when you're done? <laughs> <laughs> I do okay with Ikea, but you, I don't know if you remember, this is a digression, but there was actually a book called The Volkswagen Repair for a Complete Idiot. <laughs> and that was a very popular book back in the day, and it was how you as ordinary uh, Joe could uh, rebuild your Volkswagen, and I tried it, and the car didn't actually work very well when I was in uh, Not so much. But you yeah. have written, and I found this uh, fascinating as a mar quote-unquote marketing guy, you've written, quote, the transformation of Volkswagen from Nazi propaganda project to counterculture phenomenon was one of the most spectacular examples of rebranding in the history of marketing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, think about it. This is a car, as we were talking about before, that was basically built for Hitler, and then becomes this counterculture phenomenon. It was the sort of the vehicle, the ride of choice to get to Woodstock. And uh, it's amazing how that happened. You know, a lot of it has to do. Well, and then, and then remember Herbie the, Lug Bu the, the Love Bug? How, there were multiple movies, Herbie the Love Bug, yes? Uh, yes. I remember them as a kid. And I, I, you tell me if I'm misremembering this. This was sort of back in the day when things were a little more innocent and companies didn't necessarily pay for that sort of stuff. They didn't pay for those movies, right? Not, not that I know of, no. And, uh, and there was something kind of anthropomorphic about the, the Beetle. It's hard to imagine any other car, you know, a Camaro, <laughs> you know, the Love Camaro. It's hard to imagine something like that. Uh, the Love Thunderbird doesn't quite work. There's something about the Beetle that was sort of cute uh, and lent itself uh, to that. And, you know, the whole history, of course, was forgotten. You know, and it had a lot to do with the ad agency that they hired, Doyle Day and Bernbach. It's a very revolutionary ad agency. Uh, that, I mean, that Think Small ad with the picture of the Beetle and those two words above it, I, I mean, you tell me, I, but best I could tell, it's one of the five most iconic pieces of advertising, certainly in the car industry and maybe of all time. I don't know. What do you think? No, absolutely. I, I spent <laughs> had a brief and, and unspectacular career in advertising myself. And that uh, was, um, uh, it, it's totally revolutionary for its time. It revolutionized, revolutionized the whole ad business because up till then, everything was, you know, big, uh, overstatement, uh, hyperbole. And here's a company that came along and just said, we're, you know, we're kind of, small and, and fun and cute and not sort of beating you over the head with some kind of sales pitch. And they, they sort of hit the, the zeitgeist perfectly. It, it, it is fascinating to me to think that many, so many years later, essentially stole that, uh, if you will, position in the category of the fun, every person, small car. They distinguish themselves around motoring as distinct from driving and how cool and fun motoring is and how, you know, when you get a scratch on your Mini, it's not a big deal because it's like getting a scar in life and you remember where you were when you were motoring and got the scar and all this bullshit. And it was, it was awesome. And they sort of took that fun, small, every person, zippy, playful uh, position away from VW. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is, you know, I, I, I have a lot to do with BMW. I know BMW pretty well as well. And they, they just understand the U.S. market better. They, uh, they, they, 
it's just it has a lot to do with the different company cultures. Volkswagen is very centered in Wolfsburg and there's this kind of Wolfsburg mentality. I think they never really understood the US market. Well, and you've told some funny stories about uh, the VW leadership and uh, uh, cup holders and, and, and things along those lines. Is there, <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit more about that stuff and their sort of disconnection from Americans. They, they struggled for years to understand that, uh, you know, Americans just wanted cars with bigger cup holders. You know, they wanted a cup holder that could handle your typical McDonald's paper cup or Starbucks or whatever. And uh, the people in Wolfsburg just didn't get that. It seems like a simple thing. And a guy I talked to who's in the book, uh, who was a German working in the United States and was having trouble getting this message across. So one time he had all the executives were out in Los Angeles and in the, got him in the morning. They had a caravan of Volkswagens and they pulled up to the drive-in window at McDonald's and they got breakfast. And then he said, okay, everybody's, keep driving and eat your breakfast. And to the Germans, this is totally foreign. You would never drive and, and eat at the same time. But Americans, of course, you know, they, they, that's how they commute. You know, they, they do their whole morning routine while they're driving. And uh, that sort of finally got it home that they had to get bigger cup holders. But that's sort of emblematic of how much trouble they had, just kind of understanding American culture and what they needed to do in the American market. Which seems so bizarre, given they transformed Hitler's favorite car, Hitler's pet project, uh, into one of the most iconic American brands in history, that then years later, they don't get American culture. Um, and I mean, living here in Santa Cruz, California, there's nothing more emblematic of California surf culture than the VW bus. I think that was, you know, it was kind of accidental. They had never designed, I mean, they never really changed the design of the Beetle from what they had showed Hitler back in the 30s. They made some changes to it and modernized it some and sunroofs and so on, but it was still the same basic product. It was never designed for the U.S. market. And when they got in, it was just kind of accidental that it, it just hit a nerve in the United States. But so, they had, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Jack. Well, just when they, when they later on, when they then had to actually sort of consciously did not design a product for the United States, they didn't really know how to do it. And they struggled with that for a long time. So if I go back for a second to, you know, this is one of the greatest transformations in marketing history from, from Hitler to counterculture icon. Is there nothing marketers can learn from that? I mean, did they just literally, you know, accidentally buy a winning lottery ticket or did, you know, were they intentional enough to make that happen? I think that you can certainly learn an awful lot from the advertising campaign. And I think it's the, uh, if you have an unusual product that you need an unusual marketing campaign, um, and that uh, it can be very profitable to do something really kind of uh, revolutionary and unexpected. Uh, I think that's the, the big lesson. And I think the other thing, and here we sort of come back to Steve Jobs and Apple, was the, uh, the appeal of simplicity. Because when you think about the iPhone and actually all Apple products, they're just really easy to use. And uh, that was true of the Beetle. It was just a really easy kind of friendly sort of product uh, that didn't demand a lot of you and worked really well. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of what Apple is all about too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. It's interesting that VW in the 60s and 70s proved that uh, user experience is a massive differentiator. <laughs> uh, so it's in about the 2005 time frame where they make the conscious decision to be lying bastards. Yeah. And they, so they, they were building this engine and they realized that they get, the United States has stricter nitrogen oxide limits than Europe. So they realize they're not going to be able to meet the nitrogen oxide limits on a continuous basis that certain valves in the engine would clog up if you had the pollution controls running full blast the whole time. So they're struggling with this and somebody comes up with the idea uh, it turned out Audi was already using a kind of variant of this cheating software. Someone said, let's just adapt that for this new diesel motor. And that's what they did. They, uh, they wrote uh, specifications for software, how you would recognize when the car was on the test bed. And then uh, the engine computer would then crank up the pollution controls. Now, 
Uh, it's just so unbelievable to think that a company that had that position, you know, that, that how could Herbie the love bug fucking do this to us? Um, and, and, and so here's my question on culture. So one is, okay, so, you know, maybe the company's rotten from the beginning, right? Because uh, you got Satan as the, as the, as the seed capitalist. Um, but then here's the other huge question I've been dying to ask you, Jack. So I like everybody in business, uh, I guess what, somewhat 20 years ago or whenever it came out, read Good to Great and Built to Last by Jim mm-hmm. Collins. Uh, Jim's a good friend of Kevin Maney, um, you know, the, the, my co-author or our co-author on Play Bigger and, you know, obviously wrote two of the most important business books, um, you know, maybe ever, but certainly incredibly important business books. And of course, one of the big things in that book or those books is this notion of a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And Jim teaches us that legendary companies have BHAGs and he talks about, you know, Microsoft, a computer on every desktop and all this sort of stuff, right? And I bought into all that. And, and uh, ever since then, um, for the most part, companies I've been involved with have had BHAGs. And I've seen those BHAGs work really well. At Mercury, we set a BHAG to be one of the top five software companies. And while we never achieved that, it was a, it was a, it was a guiding sort of objective for the company. And it kind of fired people up. And so this leads to my question, which is, so VW in the mid-2000s, sets this goal to surpass Toyota and become the largest from a unit perspective manufacturer in the world. Yes? Right, exactly. That was their BHAG, yeah. And so what, and, and this may be a stupid question, but I don't know, what is the correlation between establishing that BHAG and purposely, intentionally being assholes in your mind? Well, I think, I mean, I, I'm in favor of BHAGs too. I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with that at all. Um, but the, I think the key thing is, and there's a, there's a guy at uh, Yale School of Management named David Bach who talks about this. The key thing is you have to have uh, some red lines. You have to have company values that everybody understands. These are the sort of ethical red lines that we are not going to cross as we pursue our BHAG. You know, we're not going to use child labor. We're, you know, there's some things I think most people understand, but it's got to be clear to everybody what those kind of limits are that you're observing as you're pursuing your, your BHAG. And then that's what was missing in books one. And then you not only have to have those, but the top management has to live them in a visible way that so everyone understands this isn't just kind of something we've written down on paper. It's, it's real and top management believes in it. And that's what was, was missing at books one. So you've written, quote, the succeed at all costs mentality prevalent in modern boardrooms led to one of corporate history's farthest reaching cases of fraud. And so, Jack, is, do, you, do you see this as a broad based or a more broad based um, problem in business today or is this an isolated situation? No, I think absolutely it's a problem today. And, you know, there's... The fact that we're still getting scandals like Wells Fargo shows that it's a problem. We, we just saw that on a grand scale in the finance industry in general since uh, 2008. Uh, I mean, Deutsche Bank is another example of a company that I've written about a lot. Uh, they're based here in Frankfurt. Same thing. And um, it's, it's when you demand a lot of people and then don't set any limits for them and don't give them any avenues if they're feeling uh, uneasy about something they're being asked to do. This, this type of thing is, is bound to happen. And I think anyone who works at a big corporation knows that the, the, the level of pressure right now is very high. And uh, I, I would say that's endemic. And so that's why it's probably the type of thing that's waiting to happen at other companies that are not careful to, to set those ethical limits that I was talking about. And it's interesting, for some reason in my life, uh, almost since the start of Legends and Losers, Jack, which was in, in, in well, the beginning of the year, our first episodes dropped in, in February, um, this topic of, if you will, the role of the company or the role of the corporation in our world, like forget profits in the quarter and, 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 and all of that, but like, what role are companies playing um, in the world? 
seems to that topic just seems to be up in my life. I, I don't know why. Um, and, and it feels like VW and, and uh, Wells Fargo and then in Silicon Valley, you know, we've had similar things. Uh, there was a company called Zenefits that I actually did a little bit of consulting for who, do you remember they wrote a piece of software to uh, enable their salespeople to pass the insurance test um, because they sold that, the, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. And when that got found out, that was a holy, I mean, you actually wrote a piece of software and I forget it had a nefarious sounding name too. It was really, really something extraordinary. And then of course the other thing we have going on in Silicon Valley uh, hugely right now, or bigly, if you will, is the, the exposing of the amount of um, discrimination and harassment of, of women and minorities. And so where do all these things, do you think that's where they come from when there's, there's a governance breakdown when there's a lack of transparency. Is it that at a high level, that simple, at least to think about, maybe not to fix, but at least to think about? Yeah, I, I do think it's basically that simple. I mean, all, all these things that you mentioned, there, there was somebody at a high level who was encouraging it, if not explicitly uh, condoning it or ordering it, certainly giving people at a lower level a feeling that this was what was expected. Um, or this was what was needed to, to meet their goals. I, I really do believe that that is a common element at some level in all of these things. Now, the interesting thing as well that makes VW even worse, and, and often seems like the case, but hopefully you'll elucidate for me. Um, so VW gets caught for the first time, or their suspicions in the first time in 2015. Am I remembering that right, Jack? It's actually 2014. 2014. Right. And, and you write extensively, uh, and, and more than insinuate, but I, uh, I, as I remember, we're fairly explicit that in some ways the cover-up and the lying and the, and, and, and the you know, not being transparent with regulators and so forth was even worse than the actual uh, crime itself. Is that what you believe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this was kind of this, uh, it was almost as if Volkswagen was ticking all the boxes to make it uh, as expensive in court as it could possibly be. Because first they had, you know, the original sin was the illegal software, that was bad enough. And then they had this clean diesel advertising campaign, so that made it into a consumer fraud. And then when there was, a, you know, just a, a handful of graduate students, professors at West Virginia University, who first kind of uh, showed that there was anomalies in the Volkswagen emissions and started the ball rolling. Uh, Volkswagen then, instead of sort of, if they had just put their hands up then and said, you know, mea culpa, uh, we screwed up big time and we'll pay our fines and please forgive us. The whole thing would have been expensive, but a lot less expensive than it turned out to be. But that's, that's not what happened. And so this part of the story I also find incredibly fascinating and incredibly illuminating for um, entrepreneurs, CEOs, board members, venture capitalists, business leaders of all kinds. That's why I, I really do think, Jack, every business leader should read your book because it's such a cautionary tale. Um, and, and, and I think it blindsided me, you know, as a kid who grew up in the 70s, Herbie the Love Bug. I, you know, I bought the whole fucking thing, right? And so when this happened, there was a very, very much a how could Herbie do this to us kind of a feeling for me. And I've owned VWs and so forth. And so anyway, to get back to how they got caught, in the United States, which agency is supposed to uh, govern uh, emissions? Well, it's the, it's the Environmental Protection Agency. That's what, that's what I thought, right? And yeah. so for 10 years, the federal EPA in the U.S. does not catch this, right? That's correct. And neither, with all due fairness to, or no due respect to the EPA, none of the regulators in Europe catch it either. No. Well, that's, I mean, one of the lessons of this is that enforcement in Europe is a joke, but that's, that's a whole different topic. But I think, you know, the, the people who really kind of did the forensic work and uh, eventually nailed folks one was the California Air Resources Board. So, so what is the California Air Resources Board? What is that thing? It's like the, it's the state EPA. It's the um, uh, clean air enforcer. But I think what makes CARB, you know, when you talk to uh, auto executives, they're more afraid of CARB than they are of the EPA. And because... 
you know, in, in Washington, the EPA is a political pinata. It's never really had uh, unambiguous political support, always starved for resources. CARP in California, there's much more of a political consensus in favor of clean air, Republicans and Democrats. And it feels like living here, we have to get our car smogged every 15 fucking minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're very serious, as I'm sure you know, and I don't know what it's like in other states, maybe you could tell me, but like here, when your car is up to get quote unquote smogged, which is essentially to go get tested, uh, you can't get your tags until you've been smogged. And right. so, and of course, if you don't have your tags up to date, guess who pulls you over, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that... That's the body, that's the government. So it's the California version of the EPA, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. But and why do you think they're stricter and, 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 and more on the ball than the federal EPA or the EPA in a you know, pick, pick your European country, Germany, or wherever? I think it's that they, they have the political support that's lacking for those, some of those other agencies. Because if you're a government agency, you know, at some level you need the legislature and the executive to be behind you, not always undercutting you. And uh, I think California has that. Uh, I'm sure it's not a perfect system, but I, I think it's working better in California than almost anywhere else that I'm aware of. So Californians can, that care about their air can be proud of that, and the rest mm -hmm. of the world can be glad that the California version of the EPA is there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it, there's probably things you can criticize about CARB, too. I mean, it took them a while to figure it out, but they were much more sort of diligent and... Uh, it was sort of Columbo-like in the way that they just kind of stuck with it uh, as Volkswagen for months and months tried to uh, distract them and feed them false information, do everything possible uh, to, to, to get in their way. And they just kind of stuck with it. I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. That's awesome. And so um, what is it that the folks at CARP first understand and why do they say, hmm, I want to drill into this? Well, so they, they, well, they had, had their eyes on diesel for a while because they're thinking, well, this, this could be a promising technology, but we're a little worried about all those nitrogen oxides. So they sort of had it in their minds uh, for quite a while. And then this group from West Virginia, a bunch of students, they get a grant from an NGO to test the German diesels in the United States. And so and this part of the story is a part that I really think is fascinating and incredibly important. So if you, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to unpack this. So an NGO, a non-government organization that is funded by uh, the private sector, individuals and or you'll tell me who, who the NGO is, they give a grant to a bunch of kids at a university in West Virginia? Basically, it was, it's the International Council on Clean Transportation. The International Council on Clean Transportation. Right, which was basically found by, founded by regulators and ex-regulators as kind of a way for all the sort of clean air enforcers in Europe and the United States to have a dialogue. And so there was a debate in Europe about they wanted to have stricter nitrogen oxide standards. And the car makers are saying, no, that'll never work. It's too expensive. We can't do it. We don't have the technology. And, and the ICCT is thinking, well, wait a minute. Volkswagen is selling these cars in the United States. How come it works in the United States? And it's not, and it can't work in Europe. And so, I just want to make sure I completely understand, because I think it's incredibly important. On one hand, VW is telling uh, the United States, "Hey, we can't meet these emission uh, laws. This is ridiculous. You got to go easy on us." Um, but at the same time, they're selling these cars that meet the standard. So, in Europe, they're having this one conversation, but somehow. They're meeting California standards in the U.S. And so the ICT, International Council on Clean Transportation, goes, what's up with that? Right. Exactly. And do they, they must key off the work that CARP did, yes? Do that, and what's the connection between the two? Or how, does, how well, should they, we think about... People with CARP, they were all in a dialogue. You know, this the number of people who were specialists in emissions are pretty, uh, you know, it's not a huge group, and they all knew each other. And um, so they... Uh, award this grant $70,000, you know, about what you'd pay for a, a pretty nicely uh, optioned Audi. I was just going to say, that's a nice car, isn't it? <laughs> so, and uh, the West Virginia University in Morgantown, which has this program that for many years had been specialized in uh, vehicle emissions. So they had the expertise. 
And so it was a bunch of graduate students and staff people and professors who put together a research project and then they, and they had equipment that allowed them to test the cars on the road. So they tested in the garage. But and do you think know. that the testing on the road versus testing in the garage was a big part of the aha? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, that, that was absolutely, see, that's what tripped up Volkswagen because you remember the software was programmed to recognize the test cycle in a garage. It was not programmed. It was programmed when the car was out on the road to just kind of let the emissions flow. And so these guys from West Virginia had equipment that they could uh, measure the emissions underway. And they did a lot of testing, mostly in California, driving around Los Angeles all the way up to Seattle and back and taking the measurements and quickly noticed that uh, the Volkswagen emissions, there was a huge difference when they left the garage and went out on the road. And uh, they didn't quite, they didn't really think it was something illegal. They thought it was some kind of technical problem, but they put out a paper about it in early 2014 and uh, they've been using CARB facilities to do some of the research, so CARB was aware of what they were doing. And uh, so they put out this paper, which not really anybody paid attention to, but CARB noticed and said, hmm, we better look into this. And then CARB did then a much more uh, detailed and extensive uh, study, you know, using all the resources they have as a government regulator. And so, you know, maybe CARB would have continued, but it's clear here that a non-government organization, ICT, woke up and to your point, I guess the, the emissions world, is that, is, that, is that how we should think about these folks? Sure, the, the, the experts, you know, it's not, not a lot of people who go to college or, you know, when their kids say, gee, I want to grow up to be an emissions expert. It's a pretty yeah. smart And so they get funded to the tune of a nice Audi. And, uh, and they take down one of the biggest companies in, in history. That's what happened. Now, so we're 22 billion in roughly with billions more to go. And we have a company here that was puking this stuff into the air 40 times more than the legal limit, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you describe the level of brand damage and or outrage to Volkswagen, Porsche, Audi, Ducati, all of the VW companies slash brands? What, what's happened to them since? Well, I, I think it's been huge damage to the brand. I mean, on the other hand, you have to say that sales are still holding up. I mean, they've, they've taken some hits, but there hasn't been a complete collapse in sales. I still tend to think that this is something that's going to be very corrosive over a long period of time and could turn out to be more expensive. And, and then meanwhile, in Europe, uh, it's the whole diesel, uh, not just Volkswagen, but all diesel technology is suddenly uh, experiencing huge rejection by consumers. Uh, so I think that the story is, is still uh, rolling, and I think it could definitely get worse for Volkswagen. But in fairness to them, you have to say that they're sort of holding up at the moment. Yeah, so some of the recent news I've seen, you know, headlines from Economic Times, VW Finance Arm raises 2017 profit forecast. Uh, Volkswagen, quote, Volkswagen shrugs off scandal as it posts profit. And this headline uh, uh, just sort of blows me away that uh, Europe's largest automaker said it is now expected revenue to beat last year's record 217 billion euros. And they're growing at, uh, I think, 7%, if I, yeah, here it is. Uh, end of June, group sales revenue grew by 7.3%. Grew by so they did 115.9, so let's call it 116 euros last quarter, according to Automotive World. And so I just look at it and go, the fuck's wrong with the world? Like, I would never buy another product from these assholes ever, ever. They're lying fucking assholes. And yet, uh, am I reading this wrong? They're having record quarters? What the fuck's going on, Jack? Well, I personally don't think it's sustainable. But I mean, I guess there's two explanations. One is that most consumers don't care. That's possible. Um, there's definitely a lot of incentivizing going on by Volkswagen. So again, you know, that's what makes me wonder whether really how sustainable it is. I mean, the other thing is that, you know, as angry as you might be at the management, Volkswagen has 600,000 employees 
and the vast majority of them had no knowledge of this or anything to do with it at all. And they're the ones that are going to be left holding the bag. So I'm not sure that uh, not buying a Volkswagen is the right thing, or maybe you shouldn't buy a Volkswagen until you feel the company has changed uh, if, if it's concerning you. But uh, that's, that's the hard thing with this is you punish the company and you're really punishing a lot of innocent people along with it. And, that's, that's and look, I have empathy for those innocent people, for sure. I think, I think any real human being, of course, would. Um, to your point, the, I'm sure the vast majority of people who work at the VW Group are hardworking people who love their families and countries and communities and want to be good people. And of course, had no knowledge of any of this shit. But here's the part that's just mind-blowing to me. So these guys commit one of the biggest frauds in corporate history. They, and it's not just a fraud that, you know, helps them beat competitors. It's a fraud that literally accelerates the, the uh, greenhouse gases in our world. And to your point in research in the book, accelerates the number of people who go to the ER for asthma and, 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 and lung cancer and the like. And nothing fucking happens. Sure, they got to pay out 20 something billion and maybe that'll be 30 and maybe that'll be 40, but they're a gigantic company. What, what do you, do you know, Jack, what their cash position is now? They have enough cash for now. Uh, I think the longer term, the problem is, you know, that there's this big transformation going on in the, the car business, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and they need that money for research and development. So that's, that's the longer term danger. But, but, but have- you look at it and you go, wait a minute, nobody went to jail and the fines are, while the numbers sound huge and they are, they're not actually punitively huge. That is to say, um, there's a very good chance that the company continues. And, but this is the worst part. I wonder whether the punishments stop anybody else. So, for example, when I look at the Wells Fargo thing and I see they have to pay, you know, 180 or 200 million, I think I have it here in my notes, in fines. Well, in the case of Wells, yeah, 185 million. And Carrie Tolstead, the uh, executive responsible for this, walks away with 125 million bucks. And yes, she had to give some of it back. And yes, the CEO who also walked away with a ton of money has to give some of it back. But I bet you Carrie isn't missing a meal. And so you just look at these things and go, okay, in the case of VW, no one goes to jail. They pay huge fines and all that. They got to buy the cars back and all that. But the reality is it didn't hurt the company. Sales are up. And so it has, have, have we as a society created a perverse environment for these kinds of companies to do this shit? I think the incentives are, st- are definitely misaligned. They're, they're still, there has not been enough change to prevent these things from happening. I'll tell you a quick story. I just last week I spoke to a, a group of lawyers and afterwards one of a guy came up to me who was turned out to be a judge. And he said, you know, this, What gets their attention is, what's going to get their attention is when somebody at the board level goes to jail and you can hit them with fines and everything, but they tend to do okay and even keep their jobs, as is the case in Volkswagen. And as soon as somebody gets marched off to jail, then that really gets their attention. And I think that's what needs to happen. And you probably need to uh, change the laws in a way that makes top people criminally responsible when this type of stuff happens on their watch. And, 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 and what, look, our jails are full of people who knocked over liquor stores trying to feed their family. And I, look, I'm not saying that we should be soft on crime. Far from it. I think we should be tough on crime. I, I'm, fra- I'm frankly a, a believer in capital punishment. You know, uh, I've been to Singapore many times. There's no crime in Singapore. And the reason there's no crime in Singapore is if you do something nefarious, they cane your ass. And I have friends in law enforcement in the United States, and and, and I say to them, look, what's the fundamental problem? And the fundamental problem, they say, is that a jail is not a deterrent for most criminals because they just kind of expect to be in jail. So anyway, uh, it's a digression. But I I think if you knew you were going to get caned, you'd be really focused. But in the case of these bastards, not only do they not get caned, they have to give up some small percentage of their giant going away presence. And in the case of VW, 
like there's no senior leader that's going to jail right now. It looks like some mid-level people in Detroit may go to jail. Is that, is that, is that where we're at or where are we? Right. Well, there's one, one guy who's in pretrial det- detention. Uh, his name is Oliver Schmidt, who's in Detroit. He just pleaded guilty uh, last week. And there's a guy in jail in, in Germany. And, 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 and he was a mid-level guy, too, if I remember right, wasn't he? Mid-level. He was four or five levels down. Uh, so at the top level, no sign of anybody going to jail. But, you know, to, to go back to what you were just saying about caning and everything, I, I don't think when you're talking about chief executives, they do not like to go to jail. So they're terrified of jail. So I think we should cane them and send them to jail. I wasn't in the case of chief executives. I think it should be both in, in this kind of situation. Look. You know, as a senior executive, you take a lot of risk. And, and uh, the reality is you get paid to take a lot of risk, right? And so if you fail to meet the numbers and, you know, you, you don't become the category king, you have your ass kicked and you compete and you fail, well, that's one thing. Maybe you were, maybe you were shitty or maybe you didn't get lucky or whatever it is. But to me, that's fine. I don't think CEOs should be jailed for failure to perform, right? That's what we right. get paid to do. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. God knows I got more failure in my life than I have success. But this is a whole other thing. Not only do you have an intentional decision to lie, but then once you get found out, you have one of the most coordinated, uh, obs- uh, you know, uh, obstructionist efforts in the history of the corporate world un- un- is what I read in your book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have both here, right? You know, you have the both the, the, the taping at Watergate and the I am not a crook part of Watergate, right? Hmm. And these guys should go to jail for this. I think that, well, I mean, I got to be careful what I say because I'm a New York Times reporter. But the, uh, you know, and we don't have the smoking gun that's linking uh, the, the, the whole thing to the very, the people at the very top. But this, you know, this happened on their watch. And there should be some consequences, I think. And, uh, you know, at the very least, you should bring in some new blood because, you know, as long as you have the old guard uh, in charge, then everything new that comes out kind of sticks to the whole company. Yeah, and one of the other things I, you know, remember distinctly, and you'll, please forgive me if it was in your book or in one of your New York Times articles or one of the the other podcasts I listened to you on, I, you know, did a bunch of research in, in advance, but... Uh, you talk about the fact that most of the uh, senior executives from VW uh, tend to be from the same area in Germany, from the same engineering school, um, et cetera. And so there's this, you know, you tell me if this is an in, in, in inappropriate way to think about it. There's a tremendous amount of inbreeding going on. Yeah, no, it's, they're all coming from the same. There's, there's no diversity in top management. Uh, and they, it was only after the scandal they had their first woman ever in the management board and um, how's that possible in 2015 2017 it was possible at volkswagen it was a very male culture i mean all of the uh, of all the engineers that are suspected in the whole thing and it's you know it's dozens of people there's i'm only aware of one woman in the whole group uh so you, you know you wonder <laughs> maybe if you had more women uh this wouldn't have happened, but it was a very male, uh, masculine type of atmosphere. And they're still, they have one woman on the board now who's in charge of compliance. I think there's still a belief that, you know, women don't understand cars, women are not engineers, so on and so forth. These old stereotypes that still prevail. Women don't understand cars. Give me a break. Uh, what a bunch of bullshit. Um, and so this is a real cautionary tale around diversity, is it not? Not just transparency. Yeah, well, you, you know, I think if they, if you'd had more diversity, people from different countries, they had one guy who was from Spain, but he'd grown up in uh, Germany. Uh, you just didn't have people bringing in different points of view. Uh, and this was not only the management board, but going down, you know, many layers of management. And uh, I guess the, the positive side was it, of it, you've got this, this German, in, German engineering culture, which is very strong and produced good products, but was all oriented in one direction. And when they had to deal with ethical things and regulatory things, they were not equipped for that. 
So, yeah. You know, I know this is probably a mixed metaphor, but I, I was saying to my wife this morning um, about this topic. It, you know what it reminds me a little bit of? It, it reminds me of like maybe a small town where sort of very few people come in. And as a result, over time, you know, the town's just breeding with the town or the village. And sooner or later, you know, you make a baby with your cousin and shit gets weird. Right. It, it, it's, it, it's kind of a little bit like that, isn't it? Like it just the level of, you know, and I don't know whether there was actual inbreeding. I'm not suggesting that unless you tell me there was. But, but that there, there, if you will, you tell me intellectual, cultural, uh, values oriented inbreeding kind of leads to I make a baby with my sister and shit gets weird. Is that, am I stretching here? <laughs> Well, that's, that's a kind of, I think it's a perfectly legitimate uh, metaphor for, for Wolfsburg. There's, there's a very kind of, people there love Volkswagen. They love the fact that you, uh, you're born in Wolfsburg, uh, you get decent grades in school, you'll get a job at Volkswagen, and you can stay there your whole life and, and earn good money. And it's this whole sort of comfortable, closed system uh, that worked for the people there for a long time, but uh, had this vulner vulnerability that uh, we've seen through the scandal. And so as you sit here and reflect today, Jack, on, on VW and, and some of the other th scandals that I know you keep an eye on, um, what do you think the big learnings for us, both as, as, as company leaders and, you know, as a society, as a country, as a society, what, what are the big takeaways here that we need to learn to get better? Well, I think that just that values, real values and ethics uh, have a real relevance to the bottom line, to the, to the longevity of, of your company. Uh, another talk I was at, a, a guy who was a professor said he'd worked at a company where they actually had a program where they weighed the reputational risk of offshore tax solutions to the financial gain. And that just made me laugh because, uh, you know, you can't ever quantify what the danger is to your reputation, what kinds of uh, problems you might have if you're caught doing something bad. And the only solution is just to build a culture where people are, uh, they know that they should, when they're at a crossroads of having to decide between the wrong thing and the right thing, that they automatically do the right thing. You know, it's so interesting that you say that. Uh, it, this reminds me, you know, the counter to this in my mind. You tell me if you think about it differently. I think about three companies that had a somewhat similar situation. You know, Odwalla, the, the California drink company, um, mm -hmm. where they weren't pasteurizing their juices. And if, my, if I remember, I think some people died. I know people got very, very sick. And Odwalla, do you remember this story, Jack? I, I'm not familiar with that one. What I know for sure is they stopped production and they stopped everybody drinking the stuff and they said, hold everything. And they got their shit together. And today they pasteurized their juices. Um, and, and, and they did a giant Mia Copa and they were not confused. It, like everything stopped and they went to work. Right. Of course, we all remember the Tylenol scandal, right? Where mm -hmm. s s several people died and ag exactly the same thing. Stop production, figure it out. Mia Copa, try to do the right thing and revamp the product. And then the other one, I know you've been at the Times for a while, uh, and I don't mean to bring up anything, um, you know, uh, that's a scab or a scar for you guys, but the New York Times faced a journalism crisis several years ago, yes? Is that, was that, a, is that a fair way to think about it? Yeah, you're probably, the, the Jason Blair scandal, which actually yes. we'd like to right after that, but yeah. Pardon me? I came right to the Times after, just after You came that. right after Jason Blair? Yeah. yeah. And so actually that may maybe even make your timing cooler. Uh, so, you know, the New York Times gets caught with this reporter who's lying, right? Right. And, and, and what, how is it that the New York Times was able to do the Mia Copa and, and clean itself up and today is still considered the gray lady and, you know, an icon of journalism really around the world when it, when, a reporter, you know, got caught doing one of the worst things a reporter can do, or, or you tell me how I should think about it. Yeah, well, it's certainly if making something up is absolute taboo as a, as a reporter at any reputable uh, company. And um, I, I think what, you know, the Times realized that our brand equity, uh, our reputation is totally built on our credibility. 
And that's really what gives the whole organization the value that it has. And that's something that you were made aware of every single day that you work here. And I think is totally ingrained in the corporate culture. So I think the reflex when this came out, and I wasn't here at the time, and I was not involved in the decision making, but from what I know about it, the obvious thing to do was to just come out with it, tell the readers, we screwed up, we're really sorry, this is what we're doing to change, these are the consequences and the lessons that we're, we're drawing from the whole thing. And, that and, and to my knowledge, the integrity of uh, the New York Times really hasn't been much in question since then, or am I misremembering that? Uh, I, of course, I'm biased, but no, I think that we are very trusted. And you see that in, in uh, the uh, subscription numbers uh, recently, when people, at a time when people, I think, are feeling insecure about where their information is coming from and what they can trust and not trust, uh, our subscriber numbers are going up very steeply. Yeah, yeah, and because they trust us. And so, compare and contrast for me. And this may be an unfair question because of you know your allegiance to to the Times, but compare and contrast for me the kinds of things that you saw the New York Times do to double down on, uh, if you will, it, its core values and its true north around journalism after it was shaken to the core. Um, versus what you see going on at VW to realign itself around a set of core values? Well, I think in both cases, it was kind of like there was sort of a, you know, a reflex, a muscle memory that kicks in almost kind of automatically, depending on what your existing corporate values are. And at the times, the, the, the reflex was to put it all on the table and apologize and see what lessons we needed to learn. And in Volkswagen, it was the opposite. The reflex was to keep lying and keep covering up. And, and you just, if you look at this whole story, there was many times when they came to some kind of crossroads and they could have, you know, they could have after the first generation of cars that improved the pollution equipment. It was many cases when they could have taken a different path, but time and again, they chose the wrong thing over the right thing. And that was the way the company was wired. And, and I think so, and that goes back to corporate culture and the type of company that you create. And that's, I think, why it's so important for everybody who runs a corporation to just think about what are the reflexes in, in my company? What do people do when something bad happens? Yeah, and who am I in the matter, right? And look, I, I understand what George uh, W. Bush said. Sometimes it can be very hard to put food on your family. Um, but you know, there's this thing we try to teach kids. We do what's right because it's right. We walk by garbage on the street and we pick that up. You know, we teach kids in Santa Cruz that cigarette butts end up in the ocean and otters can eat them and bad shit happens and they're toxic. So we pick mm -hmm. that shit up around here, right? We clean, we clean our beaches up, we, we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We do what's right because it's right. And, um, so I, I guess here's my question. I have this theory, you could tell me if I'm crazy, that there are certain companies that are possessed by demons. So for example, when the United thing happened, that was no surprise to me. I've been flying on United Airlines for the better part of 30 years. That's an evil shit company. That's a company whose employees hate it, whose customers hate it, and I bet the suppliers hate it, and I'm pretty sure the shareholders hate it. It is a fucking terrible company. And you can just tell, as a customer, how they treat you. And I, I have, you know, I've flown on them a zillion times, and they treat me like a piece of shit. And so when that happened, I was like, yeah, of course that was United. And Oscar Munoz, their CEO, comes out and says, oh, you know, this is a policy and training problem. And my reaction is, Fuck you, Oscar. This is the farthest thing. This is a culture problem because your company is possessed by Satan. And I, I don't know that there's anything United can do about it, right? Because when a company at its core is so shitty, uh, look, I, I'm not an expert in how to change the culture of a Fortune 500 company, but I don't know how you get the demons out of United Airlines. And so I guess my question to you is, what happened at the Times and what happened at VW to me are dramatically different things. You had one reporter who went off and did some bad shit. The Times took responsibility and tried to clean it up. And to the best of my knowledge, that has not happened since then. In this case, you have 
what clearly is the senior executives of the company making a decision to be nefarious and then even worse to your point jack to be even more nefarious in the cover up and just trying to make pretend this didn't happen and so i guess my question to you is is it possible for a company that has that kind of nefarious culture to actually become you know i'll, I'll pick a company that that is known for having the opposite culture patagonia well I, you know, I do think it's possible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist and, and I do think that first of all, you know, it's often it's the leadership culture. You know, the, the great mass of workers are just trying to keep their jobs and put food on the table for their families. And it's usually a management culture that you're talking about here. And um, so then you're down to a much smaller group of people and I think they respond pretty quickly to the signals that they're getting from top management. So I really do think it has an awful lot to do with the top managers and what kind of, uh, how they behave themselves. Whatever they do legitimizes the people underneath them. And so I think if, you know, if United, uh, you know, if you brought the Dalai Lama in to run United or something, or, you know, somebody with a different attitude, I think you could change the company. It wouldn't happen overnight. It, there's a lot of sort of formal things that need to happen. You probably need to have training courses and all that kind of stuff. But the most important thing is just what kind of signals the top management, management is sending. But see, I would have expected at VW, and you tell me if you think this is a stupid expectation, that when the new chief executive got appointed, that the first thing he would have done would have been conducted a massive internal investigation, not a, not a, not a bullshit one, but a real one. And, you know, I, I don't know how many people were involved, um, but you say it was in the hundreds over time, Jack? At least, yes. So here's my question. How many people ha has VW fired over this? Uh, I think the number of fired is, is probably about 20 or so. Uh, it's a pretty small number. I mean, a lot of people discipline transferred um, but, and there was an internal investigation, but I think it was geared towards, uh, it was done more for legal reasons than because of any really sincere desire to, yeah, yeah, that was coming out and everything that had happened. Um, and, and so I guess that's my point. If you don't cut all the cancer out, the cancer comes back, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so think, is it fair to believe that uh, the demon still lives inside VW and could rear its ugly head again? I suppose. I mean, I think the, the, the bigger problem is just that uh, they won't, maybe even if they don't commit any more huge wrongdoing, uh, there will be this sort of corrosive effect on the, the company, uh, on their brand, on their sales, on their ability to react to the market. And eventually the people who suffer for that will be the employees who had, yeah, nothing. who had nothing to do with it. I also, I've been trying to dig around and, and maybe I just, uh, you know, don't know how to do my research so you can help me a little bit. I'm very curious. So VW in the United States was forced to buy back the cars. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they were forced to pay about one and a half times market value per vehicle. Is that, am I remembering that right? Yeah, I think that's about right. It's certainly more than market value, blue book value of the vehicle, right? I think it was about a blue book value, but then they got compensation on top of that. Yeah. And okay. Uh, and, and, but where do the cars go? <laughs> like, do they just dump these off into some country with no regulations okay. and they keep puking? No, I think part of the deal was they couldn't be sold to, to other countries with lower standards. I guess eventually they'll be scrapped. Uh, I hear that they're uh, uh, just sitting in big lots. I, I don't know what the heck they're going to do with that. Man, I sure hope they don't show up in countries with uh, very little regulations because that's the kind of thing these nefarious bastards want to do, right? And try to monetize this quote unquote asset that they now have. Yeah, I think that they had to agree not to do that as part of the whole settlement. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I hope Jack Ewing is watching them with an evil eye on stuff like that and other nefarious evil things they might be up to that I can't even think of. <laughs> because I, will, I promise you that. You know, and, and this is why I want to say thank you to you, Jack. You know, bless you and the New York Times and an independent press. Because uh, the pressure from you guys and the pressure from uh, ICT 
you know, without you, like our government doesn't catch this. And without you, the story doesn't really get told. And so what I love about this is the breakdown of our governments to protect us, which is what they're supposed to do, right? I'm a huge fan of free markets, entrepreneurialism, capitalism. I'm a kid who grew up with nothing and I've had a miraculous life and that's because of entrepreneurship. But this is a great example of, to your point earlier in our dialogue, a free market can't necessarily take care of all this. And here's a situation where our government, who we pay in California, 60% fucking taxes to protect us, right? And maybe it took them a while, but our California government catches it, ICT catches it, and then the history of the story plays out. But what I'm trying to say to you is, I don't think this stuff gets to where it gets to today if it isn't for Jack Ewing and the Gray Lady. Well, thank you, Christopher. That means a lot to me. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I see myself just as the storyteller. You know, I, I, I did some investigative work. I'm proud of that. But, you know, in this case, I, I think the heroes are really the people at CARB, these bureaucrats that are always, people are always dumping on the bureaucrats. But it was, they were really the ones who, who did this very tedious scientific work that you had to do to, to pin down Volkswagen. And, you know, they get, they get a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're, they're the real heroes. And, and what I'm saying to you is a giant thank you from me as somebody who thinks this is incredibly important, um, not, not only from an environmental perspective, which it, it makes me want to put a fist through all their fucking heads, but that I think all of us should demand more from companies, right? It's not just about earnings per share. It's where we go for eight to 10 hours a day, right? It's about yeah. more than EPS. It's about more than EBITDA and margin expansion. Those things matter a lot, but companies have a bigger role in our world. And I think without you to shine a light on, you know, the heroes at CARP and the heroes at ICT and the heroes in West Virginia, this uh, change doesn't happen. I agree with you. And I mean, on that same point, you know, also as a consumer, you should have a responsibility because the car company, the one reason they did this is they didn't think that consumers really cared about emissions. Nobody goes into the deal. The attitude was nobody goes into the dealer and says, I want a car with low nitro nitrogen oxides. And so I think to some extent also as consumers, we have to take on that responsibility and really think about the impact of, of what what we're buying and what kind of incentives that we as consumers are giving to the, the companies. I do yeah. appreciate that. Well, I, I think what you've done is incredibly important. Um, I think your book is a must read for uh, entrepreneurs and executive leaders and, you know, bless you and the gray lady. Thank Jack, you, is there, is there anything else before we uh, kick out of this wave? No, I think we've covered it very well. And I, Christopher, I really appreciate, uh, no one's asked me as, as many uh, sort of intelligent questions over such a long period of time as you have. So I really appreciate the, the time that, you, that you've devoted to this subject. I appreciate all the kind things you said. Well, it's nice of you to say, Jack. Um, and I do it because I think it's important. I think you did amazing work here. You did, you did, you did what I think, Anybody with an IQ larger than their shoe size hopes that a powerful, independent, as objective as possible as human beings can, free press is supposed to do. And I love the fact that you took your reporting from the Times and blew it out into what I think is, for lack of a better description, the Bible now on, on, on transparency and govern, governance for executive leaders and entrepreneurs because i think those of us in the entrepreneurial community those of us who are who have been or are officers and, and directors of public companies are absolutely mental if we say this can't happen at our company you know we all know what what a bad seed can do and you know um uh, i think we have to work hard and i think what's going on in silicon valley right now is a real wake-up call i you know i look at some of our press in silicon valley right now and it's terrifying to me the the discrimination and and um, 
and, and the abuse that we're now starting to see, particularly, uh, of course, of minorities and women that's starting to come out, never mind the abuses um, that we talked about earlier. And so I just love it. So th thank you so much. And uh, whenever you have anything else you think is important to talk about, Jack, I would love to have you back. You're a very honorable man. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. I really appreciate it. Take thank care. you, my friend. Whew, there he is, Jack Ewing. Thank you so much for your generosity, Jack. And thank you for writing uh, an incredible book that's an eye-opener for all of us. If you like this episode, you will love episode number five with industry icon, a tech industry icon, and journalism guru, Bob Evans. OneLifeFullyLived.org. Check us out. We have our uh, uh, annual West Coast Conference in Sacramento coming up on October 21st and 27th. One Life Fully Lived is a nonprofit started by my good friend, Tim Rode, and run by my good friend, Brian Rocha. And um, it is our objective to do everything possible at as cheap a price as possible to help people dream, plan, and live their best life. Sacramento, October 21 and 22, 20, uh, 2017, is our big West Coast Conference. Uh, an amazing agenda, an amazing lineup. My friend and mentor, Bix Bixon, will be there. I'll be there. Come out and see us, uh, Sacramento, 21 and 22 of October, onelifefullylived.org. Also would like to shout out to Adrian Chrome for your awesome LinkedIn note. and. Uh, your legendary iTunes review titled, quote, The Chrome Dome Delivers. <laughs> you know, some of you have shown some real creativity with those uh, iTunes reviews, and uh, we get a big kick out of it. Adrian is also from the beautiful country of Australia, and we're not quite sure what's going on, but best we could tell, Legends and Losers is on fire um, in Australia. And uh, the way we could tell that is the love notes that we get from uh, – uh, friends and colleagues in that part of the planet. And so um, thank you, Australia. Um, all I would say is, hey, f feel free to keep the Vegemite down there. I don't know how the hell you guys eat that shit, but um, glad you like it and don't send me any. <laughs> oh God, I shouldn't have said that. There'll probably be a truckload of the shit coming over. But uh, Adrian, thank you so much. And uh, we always appreciate your amazing reviews. We would ask you to go to legendsandlosers.com and subscribe so you never miss any of the fun and hilarity. And if there's anything you want to tell us, we love to hear from you at blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. We would like to thank HarperCollins, Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need to build a legendary business. NetSuite, number one in cloud ERP. NetSuite, the next ready business tour, come out and see us. Spiro, the sales app for salespeople and sales managers who like to make money. Verve Coffee Roasters in beautiful Santa Cruz, California, the official coffee of legends and losers. Come visit Verve at vervecoffee.com. The Real Fast Results Podcast with our friend Daniel Hall. Check it out. It's a great show. Uh, I mentioned Mike Damphouse, Category Design Advisors. Also, Kevin Maney, uh, co-author of Play Bigger, is also a co-founder of Category Design Advisors, working with executive teams to help dominate new categories at CategoryDesignAdvisors.com. OutPosition.com, legendary marketing and category design in beautiful Singapore. PursuingResults.com, they produce legendary podcasts, and this one too. Interview Valet at interviewvalet.com. If you're a thought leader, get yourself on some podcasts at interviewvalet.com. And the awesome book from our friend Ray Wong, Disrupting Digital Business. And Kiva.org. Loans can make a difference, especially to entrepreneurs in the developing world. Get on Kiva.com and, and uh, get in the microfinance uh, game and make some loans that change lives for entrepreneurs all around the world. We would like to remind you that this oddcast is the sole property, the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. All rights do remain disturbed. Uh, we must warn you, the producers of this oddcast may have been consuming libations, and uh, this show is produced in a studio that clearly contains nuts. Legends and Losers may also contain forward-looking statements, backward-looking statements, present-moment-looking statements, and completely asinine statements. Uh, listen to Lincoln Park, RIP Chester Bennington. Man, do we ever miss you. Saw them live. They were outstanding. Legends and Losers is never tested on GMOs. Uh, jail corporate criminals, never turn your back on the ocean. Thank you, Dandy Candy. And in the event of a four-hour erection, 
please call somebody you like. Don't forget, support your local New York Times reporter and watch out for Putin. And hey, Colin, this podcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to former Volkswagen chief executive Martin Wintercorn. Sorry, Martin, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my legendary friends. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you again very soon on another episode of Legends and Losers.